My talk today uh, concerns um, the oft recited uh, that dinosaurs lived with man. I get this argument from all the creations that I talk to, most of them, of course, being the young earth variety. And even when they're not, all right, even when they're not young earth creations, they still tend to believe in the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot and things of that sort. So, um, there we go. There's things over there. Good. All right, my first recognized encounter with creationism was uh, on Easter Sunday, 1971. I, I was 11 years old. I was at my grandmother's house in a rural Arizona town, and I wanted to know how to celebrate uh, Easter the traditional way. And my grandmother only knew one way, and that was to go to church, which I thought was a really lame way to celebrate a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely went to church, and um, but I went. I, I went along with her anyway, and it was it was an experience. And the man behind the podium <coughs> described a bit of news that uh, sounded like an interesting scientific discovery, something that I was not expecting to hear in church. He said that they. Let's see. Let me get this. Uh, here we go. He said that they had found uh, sandaled footprints of a human walking alongside a dinosaur trackway on a riverbed in Texas. <laughs> and that uh, both sets of tracks dated to the same time. Can you guess the time? 6,000 years ago. <laughs> uh, so my 11-year-old mind imagined how there could be uh, some isolated community of, say, iguanodons still still wandering around in pre-Columbian Americas. Uh, and I, of course, took the sandals to be some, or the, or the human footprints would, of course, have to be Native Americans. We knew that they were here for uh, 12,000 years or so, or 6,000 years or so. Um, so well into, that, uh, well into that time range. And there's no rule that says that absolutely all of the dinosaurs had to have been extinct after or by the KT impact 65 million years ago, there could easily have been several ones yet undiscovered that could have survived into the Eocene and maybe even the Paleocene. And it's not impossible that some final remnant of that lineage may have carried on into pre-Columbian America. So let me see if I can get everything forwarded here. One problem that I did have was the sandaled footprint. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Native Americans didn't wear sandals. <laughs> they wore moccasins, and moccasins rarely leave clear tracks. And I didn't have time to give this any more thought because of the next thing that the guy said, which was proving that those were Adam's footprints. <laughs> Remember, my 11-year-old mind uh, locked into, now wait a minute. <laughs> I already knew enough about logic and assertions to know that you can't make a positive ID of anyone from, from antiquity based on their footwear. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no way anyone could audit, honestly make such a claim. And I looked around the room and no one was correcting this guy. And that <laughs> I found really amazing. Nobody, nobody raised their hand and said, oh, you, you can't say that. And so I, uh, I said to my grandmother sitting next to me, kind of under my breath, I said, Grandma, He's lying. <laughs> Her reaction was somewhat unexpected. Uh, no one really expects to have your grandmother slug you in the solar plexus. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that it is forbidden to question the man behind the podium, no matter how wrong he obviously is. Let's see if I can get in the head with this. There have actually been several tracks just uh, just in the Paluxy Riverbed near Glen Rose, Texas, that were reported to be human trackways interlaced with dinosaur tracks. And so far, most have turned out to be dinosaur tracks. In this case, some were backfilled with mud, as is illustrated here, and it is suddenly obvious on the other image. And uh, others uh, turned out to be what were said to be human footprints were just poorly eroded, and when they eroded further after having been exposed to rain and all, they turned out to be dinosaur tracks going the opposite direction. Uh, not all of them can be explained so easily. Occasionally you see one like this. Is that the right one? Yeah. Okay, I think I might have missed, missed a skip or skipped a step. Okay, um, yeah, that did. No, hold on. Yep, I am missing the slide. How about that? Okay, well, you can see the slide that's behind him. 
and we'll just have to deal with that one. I don't know why it's missing from this layout. But uh, there's a very different explanation for this type. Can you see what that is? Uh, there's a human footprint, a very poorly unrealistic human footprint. And overlaid on that is a dinosaur footprint. Now there's several footprints that have been presented and usually you just get the human footprint by itself and then occasionally you'll get it mixed with something else like a trilobite or something like that will be embedded in the footprint. But in cases like this one and the one that's strangely missing from here, what the description is that they were man-made and in the slide that's, that's absent uh, was a, a very Flintstones looking foot. It's not a very realistic foot at all and uh, there was a description on how to create it and the slab was excavated with no footprint in it. It was actually, you know, when, you, when you look at the way the sediment is, it, the, the piece of rock that was extracted was actually upside down and the footprint was carved in it kind of backwards. A little bit impossible for any kind of sedimentation that way. Uh, let's see, this was, um, was reportedly carved by George Adams, a Glen Rose resident in the 1930s. And these were popularly presented to and by creationists until the 1970s when Adam's nephew explained how they were made. And uh, let's see, the, uh, the reason the footprint, was with the, re the footprint was made by hand using hammer and chisel and a center punch to simulate raindrops, because of course you had to have a flood in there somewhere. Uh, and telltale blemishes could be dulled with muriatic acid and the fresh marks could be artificially aged by being covered in manure for a few days. Uh, the last application has become quite a tradition among pseudoscience enthusiasts. You may notice that most of the compelling arguments for creationism are in fact buried in bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving on to this slide, uh, in the creationist tradition, if you can't find any actual evidence, you create your own. Likewise, if you can't find any authorities to support you, you create those too. And uh, if those alleged experts can't get appropriate credentials, you can also create those. Uh, meet Dr. Carl Baugh. He's one of the few remaining professional creationists still trying to defend the Paluxy man track. He also has the dubious dishonor of having been called out as a fraud even by other creationists. Uh, here we see him with the with another man track with a dinosaur stepping on it. Like I said, it was not the one I wanted to show. The one I wanted to show was hokey, as I believe. Um, Baugh is a charlatan, someone who calls himself a doctor but doesn't actually have a legitimate PhD. He claims three doctorates, one of which was only an honorary degree given by an unaccredited school, which he never actually attended. <laughs> another was a school that didn't offer the degree he claimed. So he said he got it from an extension of that school located on the other side of the world but that extension apparently never existed. Somebody went to Australia and looked for it, it isn't there. His third doctorate was another honorary degree from another unaccredited school, which means, he can't, which means it can't give re, uh, degrees, honorary or otherwise, and he should have known that since he was the president of that school when he gave that degree to himself. <laughs> <laughs> One of Baugh's colleagues, Dr. Car uh, Dr. Kent Hoban, uh, isn't really a doctor either. His PhD came from a mail order service rather than an actual institution of education. So he calls himself doctor, and the facility where he now resides calls him inmate number 06452-017. <laughs> no one knows what his roommates call him when the lights go out. <laughs> He too is a fraud, and he's also one of the last of the prominent, cre prominent creationists who still says that a Japanese fishing trawler hauled up a plesiosaur in 1977. At the time, the discovery created quite a sensation in Japan, and American creationists ran with this for decades. However, tissue samples and the original documented observation determined that this was actually a basking shark. It's hard to picture from this drawing, but a dead basking shark decomposes preferentially so that at some point you do begin to look like a plesiosaur. Sometimes they wash up on the shore, allowing folks to document the entire decom decomposition into this. Uh, what you see is looking at eye sockets or actually nostrils. Uh, now look what the Japanese fishing trawler actually caught. The uh, head is mostly rotted away, but as you can see the gill bar looking like a wishbone uh, to mark where the size that the head actually was. 
I read an article with the amusing title of Maintaining Creationist Integrity. <laughs> it was Ken Ham from AnswersInGenesis.org attempting to reason with Kent Hovind of Creation Science Evangelism Ministries, trying to explain all the ways that we know that this is a basking shark and not a plesiosaur. Uh, both men are notorious for discarding evidence against their positions, but Answers in Genesis knew they couldn't look past the fact that the original observation described a skeleton made of cartilage rather than bone. Nobody wanted to believe that the Loch Ness Monster was real more than me. <laughs> As a kid, I tried to rationalize how such a thing could still exist, and eventually I had to accept that it just wasn't feasible. Nonetheless, I was still disappointed when, in 1993, a then 93-year-old 93 93 year huckster gave a deathbed confession to his part in the hoax in 1934. The head and neck that you see here are about 10 inches long and mounted on a clockwork tri uh, tin plate toy submarine. Uh, there's an interesting story behind this conspiracy and the three men involved into it, but I'm not going to go into that here. I read an article recently which said that the 2012-2013 uh, school year, um, a bill pushed through by Governor Bobby Jindal to thousands of students of Louisiana will receive state voucher, mon voucher money transferred from funds intended for public schools to attend private religious schools instead, and some of these teach from a Christian curriculum, which suggests that the Loch Ness Monster disproves evolution, that the alleged creature, which has never been demonstrated to even exist, has been tracked by submarines and probably and is probably a plesiosaur. <coughs> the curriculum also claims that a Japanese fishing boat caught a dinosaur, and plesiosaurs are not dinosaurs, but that's beside the point. The point is, that an idea that is so absurd that even the leading creationist organizations no longer defend it may now be taught as fact in Louisiana schools. And um, if Texas enacts a voucher program, that sort of idiocy will be the fate of our students too. Now, I don't mean to imply that none of the young earth creationists have any legitimate degrees. Some of the leading ones do. And when they do, they're usually of this caliber. Each of these men, uh, is a young earth creationist actively seeking to disprove or discredit evolution. Each of them has a legitimate doctorate in biology, but they are not biologists. They're certainly not scientists. Each of these men are dentists. <laughs> you may recognize Don McLeroy, former chairman of the State Board of Education, the revisionary who felt qualified to stand up to experts. This is also the man who told his fourth grade Sunday school students to keep chipping away at that objective empirical evidence. Opposite him is Dr. Job Martin, who claims to be a converted evolutionist. Uh, one of my best friends in high school now runs an evangelical Christian school, part of a megachurch in Fort Worth. And when he and I reconnected briefly in 2004, we argued about evolution, of course. Uh, and uh, he offered to introduce me to Dr. Job Martin, author of several creationist books, and lauded by many creationists the world over as an expert in evolutionism. My friend said that uh, Dr. Martin would be able to answer all the questions that I seek, and uh, instead of meeting Dr. Martin, I wrote a 19,000 word critique of his book, Evolution of a Creationist, in which I disproved every sentence in the second chapter. <laughs> Literally every one. I posted it to Talk Origins and explained it to my friend that Do Joe Martin doesn't have any of the answers because he does not even understand the questions. Nestled between these two icons of ignorance, one with a book and one with a movie, we have Dr. Javier Cabrera de Car or Darquea, shown here with the collection of native Peruvian carvings that made him famous. Cabrera had believed as Eric von Einiken did that ancient Peruvians were incapable, were capable of futuristic medical techniques, and that they had knowledge of extraterrestrial species and the technology for interstellar travel, and that they rode on domesticated dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> to prove this, he purchased hundreds of hand-carved stones and clay figurines from local villagers, some of which depicted telescopes, undiscovered planets, as yet undiscovered planets, spacecraft, and of course, dinosaurs. These he added to his existing collection of similar-looking but otherwise authentic pre-Columbian artifacts. 
Once the lies were mixed with a bit of truth, the significance to pseudoscience was exploited by professional creations like Dennis Swift. And uh, some stones depicting dinosaurs and other questionable elements were tested in German and Swiss labs and found to be decades old at most, with some made so recently that they still contained water. Impoverished villages or villagers uh, having conf have confessed to creating thousands of the stones over the years to suit Cabrera's demands. Uh, to show the natural erosion, uh, we do have, they, they show no natural erosion, but they do show traces of sandpaper and were given the appearance of advanced age by being covered in chicken shit. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's Eric Coven. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> uh, he's the son of the convicted fraud we saw earlier. And this is proof that one bad apple doesn't grift far from the money tree or something like that. In 1975, local farmers claiming to have created the first such depictions said they referred to comic books, which is why their dinosaurs are so inaccurate they look more like they came from the Flintstones. For example, Ceratopsians did not have dorsal ridges. For another example, take a look at this Tyrannosaurus. Uh, look at it, it standing straight up on its tail like kangaroos did. And we know that they couldn't have held that position because they have fused vertebrae in their tail. But they would have to adopt a position more similar to chickens. Uh, which is why this doesn't look like an actual Tyrannosaurus, but does look suspiciously like this. <laughs> Remember, even other creationists reject this, including cryptozoologists, the very ones who most want to believe in the persistence, the persistent existence of extinct paleofauna. And even they can prove that these artifacts aren't legitimate. Uh, for example, listen to what Stephen Myers, vice president of the Discovery Institute, had to say about this one. I bought a replica of an Ica stone uh, with a carving of a dinosaur on it from Kent Hovind's website. And I was amazed to find that this carved dinosaur had five fingers and five toes, a turtle-like shell on its back, and donut rings on its skin. I do not know of any dinosaur like this, he continues. My theory is that the real dinosaurs, uh, do, uh, or the, the real stones, do not have men riding on dinosaurs, or uh, telescopes, or planets, Neptune, or Uranus carved on them. These would be the fake ones. I would like to challenge Dr. Swift to allow one of his stones with a dinosaur on it to be examined and tested by experts. First-hand observation by Neil Steed said that uh, even though the stones he examined did have this uh, patina, there was no patina in the grooves, and these suggest that while the stones were very old, the carvings were clearly of far more recent origin. Once again, Answers in Genesis at one point said much the same thing, and uh, I quote, Unfortunately, some initially plausible evidences I love why they say evidences. For man's contemporaneity with dinosaurs has later turned out to be mistaken. That's a clever word for dishonest. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, allegedly genuine pre-Inca uh, engravings from dinosaur or of dinosaurs from Peru have since been shown to be a fraud. Uh, Creation 24 featured these with the cautionary label, too good to be true. In fact, it turns out that an unscrupulous Peruvian surgeon has purchased these stones from local artists and installed them in his museum, claiming them to be ancient artifacts. And the, uh, the artist himself makes uh, these stones for tourists and never claims them to be ancient. The Institute of Geological Sciences in London has since examined these stones and confirmed their modern origin. The fraud was exposed on a Nova television documentary in 2002 entitled The Case of the Ancient Astronauts, end quote. That was in 2007. Since then, perhaps under pressure from other creationist organizations still determined to promote these as legitimate, uh, Answers in Genesis seems to have pulled this, uh, this comment off their webpage. I was not able to find it. Um, now, other creationist sites argue against the evolutionist conspiracy to test only the stones that we know were fakes so that no one would know about the other ones that are really real. <laughs> but these aren't the only man-made artifacts purporting to depict dinosaurs prior to paleontology. For example, in a children's book called The Great Dinosaur Mystery, creationist Paul Taylor shows this petroglyph from the Havasupai Canyon in Arizona. Whatever it is, 
its resemblance to a, painted, a painting labeled Edmontosaurus might be convincing to children, only until they find out that the author painted this himself, <laughs> deliberately and literally contorting it to match the cliff. Because Edmontosaurus couldn't stand erect like kangaroos either, their vertebrae wouldn't allow it as well, and so they had to walk more like this. Uh, but if we compare the mystery petroglyphs to others found in the Southwest, it seems it was much more likely uh, someone trying to render a bird. I hope that's right. Here we go. And uh, this uh, is either a poorly rendered or badly eroded attempt at a bird, or it is really a dinosaur further aggravating an injury to an already broken tail. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, this image could be absolute 100% proof that there were once giant man-eating herons as tall as telephone poles. <laughs> Either that or what I think looks like a man here was really meant to be a frog, and the artist just wasn't very good. And that's probably the case for a lot of these not really dinosaur renderings too. To give us some perspective, let's look at some cave art. <coughs> Uh, these are from France, of course. These are, uh, some of these are estimated to be 20,000 years old, and in another location they are estimated to be more than 30,000 years old, and these are obviously horses. There's no, ambigu there's no ambiguity here, nor is there any surprise at seeing horses in France. But uh, this, is, this is very, this one down here at the bottom, can you see it in lower or left? Yeah, that's very definitely a rhinophone. And rhinos are not something you typically see in France, and especially not that, because those are extinct, yet there's no doubt that that's what that is. Let's see if we get a better view of it here. And uh, it's clear, and it's distinct, and it can't be mistaken for anything else. We know what this is supposed to be, unlike all of these other, you know, allegedly dinosaur renderings. Uh, here, well, there was a mammoth in there. And uh, it wasn't some strange distortion of how you would mammoth, imagine a mammoth to be. Um, it was obviously intended to be a mammoth, it couldn't be anything else, but uh, okay. And you can see this with ibex. Now these are typically, the ibex are African, and obviously the, the climate's a little different in France, but we also have mammoths representing a whole other different climate, and uh, these are where they overlap. And so these people are writing, are drawing these thousands of years ago, thousands of years before this mythic flood, and they're, they're seeing these things with their own eyes. And there we go, there we have the aurochs, the granddaddy of all Western cattle breeds. And look at this amazing detail. Now, imagine the artist behind this and wonder what it would be like for this artist to render a dinosaur if dinosaurs actually existed and he ever saw them. Okay, now we don't have to guess at these either. We don't have to squint our eyes and say, maybe that, you know, no, those, these, are, these are lions, and they're not just cats. They're, they're definitely lions, without a doubt. And it's interesting that we have what appears to be an accomplished artist doing some of the work, and as you can see, some of these are not quite so good, so we appear to have an apprentice. But even the crappy artist does it well enough that we can still tell what it is. Now, you want to see cave paintings of dinosaurs? There it is. Okay, give you just some contrast. Look at this. <laughs> and look at that. <laughs> and if you're still having trouble, uh, um, I'll help you. Remember, you just if you don't see it, maybe that you just don't have enough faith. <laughs> you got to see it. You got to you got to fake it till you make it. And you just got to believe hard enough. But here, I'll help you out. With that. <laughs> So, um, if you really saw a giant sauropod with your own eyes, is that the way you draw it? Especially if you were able to do that other, that the aurochs with the detail that you have. Let me take the highlight away. You see it now? Yeah. See how distinct? What? There, you, who, you, how could you ask for any greater proof <laughs> that dinosaurs existed than this? And um, I'll go a little step further. Okay, look at what you get here. Now, these are really impressive, large and powerful animals. These are horses and cows. And look at the attention that they get. What if you saw something that was really impressive, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, especially if it's locked in mortal combat with a woolly mammoth? What would an artist capable of this do, given such a dramatic scene as a T-Rex versus a mammoth? Prepare yourself. 
There it is. <laughs> Are you stunned? You need a little help with the fade? There, there's the highlight. <laughs> we have a battle of hand puppets with Barney <laughs> on one side and Dumbo on the other. Stay focused, because I'm stay focused on this, because I'm going to take the highlight away. Look at that. I know you're wowed. <laughs> okay, uh, and this is what creationists present as proof that all the expert specialists in the world are wrong and that only undereducated evangelists have it right. Here is the proof that Fred Flintstone really lived with Dino. And how could you argue with that? And that's not all. Creationists have uh, lots of evidence of just this stunning caliber. Uh, look at this cockatrice. This is a chicken with a dog's head and a snake's tail and bat's wings growing out of all places, its kneecaps. Let's forget the fact that it couldn't possibly fly. This is a taxonomic impossibility. Uh, it's uh, no more real than Pegasus, Manticore, or, Centicor, uh, or Centaurs, and obviously came from the same location. This is a chimera, a monster of the imagination. It obviously never existed in real life. Uh, same with this Dogosaurus. <laughs> the website I got this from uh, supposed that this was supposed to be a Corylosaurus. I think that they probably meant Parasauropolis. And amusingly, they argued that this should be considered plausible because we already have two-legged lizards. Okay, and obviously they don't understand what a dinosaur is. It doesn't matter as long as it's make-believe. That's the purpose of the whole thing. What's the excuse for this? This is a lion. It was just a lion with a ridiculously long neck and there's nothing else to do it. And I don't think this ever existed either. And everything about it says that this is a lion, yet the website I got this from argued that this was a sauropod like Brontosaurus. So, how about this? This Mesopotamian lion chicken snake. Again, if you use your imagination and you don't clutter that up with education, you can make believe that this is a sauropod dinosaur too. Of course, you'll have to ignore all the, a whole bunch of things that prove that it isn't, but that's what confirmation bias is for, right? Now, a creationist named Carl Gallops recently released a video where he said that woolly mammoths and round sloths were dinosaurs, and he defines dinosaur as any ancient extinct prehistoric animal, and that that includes mammals. And of course, there is a precise definition. Uh, it's a specific subset of archosaurs. So lizards and plesiosaurs are not archosaurs. Pterosaurs are, but they're a sister group to dinosaurs. Birds actually are dinosaurs, both by definition and derivation, although creationists usually won't admit that. Uh, when young earth creationist Lawrence Tisdale was on the Michael Horan show, these are the things he claimed as proof that dinosaurs lived with men. He claimed that they were not fantastic creatures. He said they were consistent. And uh, here's one of his examples. According to the description I read, this is two sides of the same vase. And notice that it has two heads. And notice that both sets of legs are the back legs and that both of the heads are therefore mounted on tails rather than necks. But this is not fantastic, this is consistent. Consistently crazy. <laughs> this is a favorite among anti-science cryptozoologists who don't know what a dinosaur is. And when I debated uh, uh, Bob, Pastor Bob Anyart, this was one that he threw at me. If you go to this Hindu temple in Cambodia and you go to this one particular building, and you look at the decorative relief on this one particular column, you'll see a typical creationist dis uh, desperation and distortion. Uh, look how each of these animals depicted is with, depicted with a background, very ornate, uh, similar to the repeating pattern of leaves and flower petals or whatever else these are supposed to be. And when you zoom in on this one in the middle, you'll see what creationists think is supposed to be a stegosaurus. Of course, it doesn't look like a stegosaurus, but if we imagine the background pattern as being part of its back, that still wouldn't explain why it has hooves, external ears, and the kind of wispy, dangly tail that we normally only see on ungulate mammals. If you take away the background flower petals of the image, how much like a stegosaurus does it look now? It becomes even more obvious. Now, there are those 
who think that this is supposed to be a rendering of a baby rhinoceros. Uh, I personally think that it's a pig. Uh, but whatever it is, this uh, pigosaurus <laughs> doesn't look like a stegosaur. And uh, when I debated Bob Dudko on his uh, nationally syndicated uh, radio show, he presented this also as proof of dinosaurs. And when I explained why it couldn't be, he said it wouldn't matter because he has so many other examples he had to prove his point. Once again, I'll just put those back. You see the stegosaur? Look at the tail on the, the pigosaurus and how dangly it is versus the steg, the, the steg tail. And look how tiny the head is. And look at this pig's head again, pigosaurus. Okay, and then moving on to the next one. Um, I challenged Bob Dudko to present one thing that he would back his reputation on, that he would, one thing that he could give me that could be scientifically verified to actually be a pre-Columbian rendering of a dinosaur. One thing that he could verify was actually true, and uh, that's what he came up with. A handful of Tucson artifacts, which uh, I think should be called dinosaurs. <laughs> They're a collection of cheap sword replicas made out of lead. And these were found uh, in an already excavated hole with dirt shoved on top of them in the 1930s. Uh, you can barely see, I guess maybe you can't, there's a sauropod on that that looks exactly like the brontosaurus that Fred Flintstone is riding in the, in the beginning of their cartoon. What you can't see very clearly here are the writings in Hebrew. Now, these were purported to be uh, artifacts from a Hebrew expedition into the Americas before the time of Columbus. I guess they were trying to support, I don't know, Mormonism or something. But the writings in Hebrew turned out to be exactly copied verbatim from three different Hebrew language textbooks that had already been printed at the time. And then when the, 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 the what do you call it, an artist, whatever you would you call this guy, this huckster, when he tried to, it was apparently trying to learn Hebrew, but whenever he tried to change the case or change the statement, he showed that he didn't understand how to speak Hebrew. And so these were exposed as a fraud a lifetime ago. And this is what uh, Bob Dudko thought was the most compelling, the most compelling and the most scientifically supported argument in favor of dinosaurs living alongside humans. Uh, creationist arguments and evidence doesn't really get any better than that. I uh, see this is the only thing that I saw that I thought might actually be a dinosaur. But it's only a skull and not a living <coughs> animal or not a living animal. And uh, not only that, but the, this type of skull is very common among diapsids and may as well just be a lizard. Um, lizards get confused with dinosaurs an awful lot. Snakes too. Uh, here, let me show you. This is one of the earliest depictions of a dragon, and it turns out that most of the references to dragons in medieval literature, whether in history or scripture, are referring to snakes of a, or, and a particular kind of lizard that uh, is the closest living relative to snakes. The most famous example is St. George slaying the dragon. Uh, depictions of this beast vary wildly. Uh, some of them give it mammalian features like external ears, as is shown here. Uh, sometimes they have bat's wings, and sometimes they have fur. And, uh, this sort of chimera is another evolutionary impossibility. But it usually looks about like this, like a very big lizard. And you see the tongue darting out. Remember that, can you see it? That's, uh, that's important. Here's a slightly more realistic uh, relief from the 16th century. And I'll superimpose it with another realistic rendering. And here we see the darting tongue, again indicating that this is a varanid, a giant monitor lizard, a genus of several very large and dangerous species, which includes the Komodo dragon. Apparently, it really is a dragon. And uh, it's important to note that St. George was not in England when he encountered this dragon. He was in Africa. And they really do have lizards this size. Uh, now, as a herpetologist closely familiar with these things, I've had a few of them as pets. Uh, I wouldn't suggest it, but uh, I can tell you that these are surprisingly accurate uh, renderings of varanids, uh, monitor lizards. The one exception is that the tail is supposed to be forked like a snake's and of course would only have two prongs. 
I guess it's hard to see when you first look at it, especially if you're not inclined to study such things. But when you see this motif being repeated again and again, there's obviously one artist is copying another artist's work, and it doesn't seem that anybody ever pointed out that, hey, that's supposed to be a tongue and it's only supposed to have two prongs because it keeps adding prongs as we go on until it doesn't look quite so much prong prongs anymore. What does it look like? There you go. Guys, um, of course, the site that, uh, where I found these uh, and called them dinosaurs and specifically uh, Platyosaurus. Uh, and the creationists, as I said, don't know the difference between lizards and dinosaurs. They think they're the same thing. And uh, let's see, now let's look at this depiction. And this is interesting because this was done by somebody who had obviously never seen one of these lizards. He didn't know a great deal about them. This is why it has mammalian features. He definitely didn't know that that was supposed to be a tongue because look at it and look at the flames all around it. This artist apparently saw previous works by other people and uh, enhanced this into being fire. And look what this leads to. Now we have a giant monitor lizard, such as hasn't existed in 20,000 years and never on this side of the world, but uh, look, it's also got a tongue and fire. And uh, notice also that the name of the dragon is Serpent, also known as the Worm, W-Y-R-M. Uh, historically, that's where they usually show up. So it turns out that a fire-breathing dragon is actually a tongue-lashing lizard and nobody realized it because people in medieval Europe usually had no idea that tropical lizards ever got this big. So it seems that the Komodo dragon, as I said, really is a dragon, and so are all monitors because they're the only lizards who do that <coughs> tiny thing that Mushu got completely wrong. This is a Nile monitor, named for the area where it resides, and this species is the most likely candidate for the dragon slain by George, St. George during his trip to Africa. And remember that a good portion of the Bible comes from this area also. And that many of the monstrous animals described in the Bible match African megafauna pretty well, especially the, from the oldest book of the Bible, which is actually not Genesis. Genesis is a compilation of earlier works. The oldest book of the Bible is actually the book of Job, which is about 3,500 years ago. Okay, so, uh, and, and uh, let's see. Whether you're looking at historical references from medieval times or biblical scriptures, in either case, ge dragons are generally described as snakes or lizards and are often small, sometimes venomous animals being trodden upon and are easily killed with rocks and sticks. So knowing how this animal was exaggerated over the last 500 years or so, imagine how much more primitive authors, authors from way back in the Bronze Age would have described a really impressive beast like this Nile crocodile. Now imagine that you're living in the Bronze Age, you're just over five foot tall, and you're armed with only a pointed stick and a short spear of sharpened bronze, and you are inclined or charged to take this on. <laughs> the book of Job, which was written consistent with that image, describes a huge, powerful, yet graceful monster whose mouth is like a set of great doors ringed by fearsome teeth. His back has rows of shields tightly sealed together, each so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Of course, I'm quoting from the Bible here. Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. When he rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before his thrashing. The sword that reaches him has no effect, nor does the spear, or the dart, or the javelin. Iron he treats like straw, and bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make him flee. Sling stones are like chaff to him. A club seems to him a piece of straw. He laughs at the rattling of the lance. His undersides are jagged potsherds, leaving a trail in the mud like a, like a threshing sledge. He makes de the depths churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him he leaves a glistening wick. One would think the deep had white hair. Nothing on earth is his equal, a creature without fear. And of course, I'm quoting Job again. And this is the Leviathan, described as a scaly reptilian thing with legs dragging itself through the mud. 
the common use of the word now is for whale, but it apparently did not actually mean that originally. And if you take out the obvious embellishments, giving it fiery breath as well, then what you have left matches this pretty well. Creationists, desperate to turn this into a dinosaur, often admit the fiery breath thing too, and try to say that Leviathan refers to something like a Chronosaurus or Liopleurodon, but that doesn't fit the description at all. Another biblical beast alleged to be a dinosaur, but which does not fit that description, is the behemoth. And creationists really want this to be a giant sauropod, but that shoe dust doesn't fit. Behold now the behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. And grass has never been found in the coprolites of any non-avian dinosaur because grass didn't exist yet in the Cretaceous. Lo, now his strength is in his loins and his force in the navel of his belly. And uh, dinosaurs develop within a shell of an egg and therefore don't have navels. Uh, he moveth his tail like a cedar. And this is the most contrived of all the creationist interpretations. Creationists ignore the swaying in which trees move and instead try to imply that his tail should be the size of a tree, even though the Bible doesn't describe it that way. They also omit that uh, the word cedar is sometimes used to, to describe the sprig that they would swat flies away from themselves. And of course, that looks exactly like an elephant's tail. So the description is quite accurate if you get the dinosaur image back out of your head. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together and uh, external genitalia, especially the stones, are a typically mammalian trait and not visible on reptiles like dinosaurs. His bones are like strong pieces of brass, his bars are like, uh, or his bones are like bars of iron, and the elephant is the biggest, strongest animal that anyone would have ever seen in the Bronze Age. He is chief in the ways of God. <laughs> Elephants are extremely intelligent, even compassionate animals, whereas the brain of a sauropod was only about the size of a walnut. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the cover of the reed and ferns. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. Can you imagine a Brachiosaurus or a Diplodocus doing this that sort of thing? <coughs> The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up the Jordan in his mouth. And this, obviously, uh, better suits an elephant than it does any sauropod. He taketh it in with his eyes. His nose pierceth through uh, snares. And note that it doesn't say that a horn on the nose is piercing anything. This is the nose itself. And uh, speaking of horns, one last animal I'd like to mention from uh, Job's bestiary is the unicorn. One modern concept of the unicorn is that it is a smallish horse. Do I have that slide? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, with a single, sword, a single horn coming out of its forehead. And the origin of that multi-spiral horn, people think it was based on the narwhal, and it might have been, but it, uh, there was also a fossil of a um, orthocone that was found by, reputed to have been found by Julius Caesar, and he just declared it to be the horn of a unicorn, so that's where you get that from. Uh, Psalm 1910 says the unicorn has one horn. Deuteronomy 33:17 implies it has two horns. Creationists argue that uh, these ancient <coughs> tribesmen um, were actually hunting a triceratops, which has three horns, or a monoclonius, which is uh, a ceratops you know, with a single horn in its nose. And I'm going to read it directly from the creationist website that is trying to make this argument because, in fact, they make my argument for me. In Job 39, 9 through 12, God asks, Will the unicorn be willing to serve you or abide by your crib? Can you bind the unicorn with his band and fur in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will, will you trust him because his strength is great? This passage shows that the unicorn, whatever it was, could not be tamed or used in farming as could an ox. In this classic work, uh, Naturalis Historia, the first century author Pliny the Elder described an exceedingly wild beast called the Monoceros, which is one horn. It makes a deep lowing noise and one black horn two cubits long projects from the middle of its forehead. He describes it as like an elephant in length, 
but with much shorter legs. Other classical authors like Alien, Ulpian, and Marshall also mention a nose horn creature called Rhinocaris. Mm -hmm. Some claim that Rhinocaris sharpens his horn on a rock and utilizes it to fight elephants, and this is the root word from which we get the name Rhinoceros. And to be clear, this animal's Latin name is Diceros bicornis. This animal's Latin name is Rhinoceros unicornis. There's your unicorn. Now read all those King James Bible verses again. They'll make much more sense now. Uh, one more reason that this is important, and it relates to another cryptid dinosaur being promoted by uh, creationist cryptozoologists. Uh, this is the only physical evidence yet presented for the Congolese sauropod alleged to be living in their, their uh, rivers in deepest, darkest Africa. But as you notice, this is three-toed footprint. Sauropods actually have four toes and usually have a claw on the inside. Rhinos have three toes. So this is not a dinosaur footprint. Don't be ridiculous. This is the footprint of a unicorn. 